So motor neurons are amongst the largest cells in the body. Typically they have a diameter of 20 or 30 microns. And in the case of your motor neurons in your spinal cord, which will innovate the muscles in your foot, maybe up to a meter long. So these are cells which are really rather unusual and remarkable. So if you compare them to a simple blood cell lymphocyte, which is a sort of ovoid or spherical structure of 10 microns where the nucleus and the cytoplasm are in close apposition, it doesn't have any polarity. A motor neuron is the opposite. It's highly polar. The synapses are very distant from the cell body and the nucleus. And the question arises as to how such a cell can even function in the first place. And clearly, uh, for messages or, or responses to biological perturbations, which might require the expression of genes in the nucleus, uh, how does that then result in protein uh, changes at the synapse, which may be a meter away in a healthy, fully grown adult? So that requires extremely well-organized axonal transport. And we know that that even so-called fast axonal transport occurs really at a rate which means that protein produced in the cytoplasm near the nucleus may take several days to arrive at the synapse. So if there's an acute injury to the synapse, it's not really that plausible that this is going to be uh, able to maintain homeostasis of the synapse. So as with other forms of um, neuron, like the hippocampal neurons, for example, where new memories being formed, dendrites are, are, are forming rapidly. The concept has arisen that RNA may actually be sorted in the cell and actually may be transported down the axon with a series of proteins as a complex. And textbooks 20 or 30 years ago were categorical that RNA is not found in axons, and that's clearly not, not true. It's there in very small amounts. It's difficult to visualize, difficult to capture, but we are now learning more about it. So the concept is that RNA may be trafficked to a distant site and that in response to a signal derived from your target, which in this case would be the muscle, you may get uh, the translation of specific classes of protein at a distant site. So the architecture of protein synthesis is indeed present at the neuromuscular synapse, but in very small amounts and it's difficult to visualize. So the strikingly interesting thing about that is that Genetic disorders of the motor neuron turn out to include things that arise through mutation in RNA binding proteins. So perhaps the first example of this uh, is spinal muscular atrophy. So I, I've been working on that for uh, more than 20 years. And spinal muscular atrophy is a childhood, predominantly childhood disorder in which only lower motor neurons, those motor neurons that are in the spinal cord, are affected. And it's in its most severe form, leads to death within a year or two from respiratory failure. That's so-called type 1 SMA, which was historically known as Verdnick-Hoffman disease. But we now know that there are uh, other forms of SMA which essentially are due to mutations in the same gene, and that these cause more mild disease that children survive past infancy and into adulthood. It's actually one of the commoner genetic disorders. One in 40 people carry the genetic deletion of a gene called SMN, stands for survival of motor neurons. And this gene, if deleted out in two copies, one on each chromosome, chromosome 5, leads to deficiency of the protein. And motor neurons clearly have a requirement for this protein which other cells don't. And it's probably locked into their development uh, when, when they're innovating muscle. So an important concept uh, that's helpful in, in considering motor neurons and its architecture is the motor unit. So in the ventral horn of your spinal cord, the cell body is there, the motor neuron, its axon goes out into the limb. The neuromuscular junctions that arise from that and the individual muscle fibers are the motor units. So one motor neuron innovates uh, multiple muscle fibers typically, but that motor unit varies hugely. So the motor unit of muscles which are in your trunk, for example, for posture, may include two or three hundred fibers innovated by one motor neuron. The motor unit in your eye, in your extraocular muscles, which are tonically active at high frequency, uh, may include only two or three individual muscle fibers. So quite different architectures, different energetics, and different biology. And it turns out that actually eye, eye movements are rather preserved in motor neuron diseases, which is a fascinating thing because they're very strikingly involved in other forms of muscle disease and neuromuscular junction disorder. But in motor neuron diseases, these are spared.
So in ALS, for example, it's extremely unusual to see anybody with weakness of the extraocular muscles. And people who are completely paralyzed from head to toe can still retain the ability to use their eyes and therefore use eye tracking software to communicate. Now why these cells are protected is a source of some interest and no one's really worked it out yet. And the assumption is that there's something in the cell which is biologically different. So for example, there are calcium buffering proteins which are different in extraocular motor neurons compared to spinal motor neurons. But it may be the whole architecture is what's different about it. And for example, eye movements are phylogenetically much more ancient than other sorts of movement. And that brings the interesting question of evolution and how that has rendered this system vulnerable. So for example, if you look at different species and you look at the corticospinal tract, so the uh, fibers from the motor cortex down into the spinal cord, humans have about 1.1 million fibers in this tract. Uh, it turns out the chimpanzees, a very closely related primate to us, have 800,000. So we have significantly more of these fibers. And many of these fibers are exerting a one-to-one -one relationship between a cortical motion neuron and a spinal motion neuron with direct synaptic contact. Whereas in other species, typically this goes via interneurons. So it's a completely different system. And there's a more direct uh, and perhaps excitotoxic potential for this, these, these fibers to cause damage. And the likelihood is that uh, this has arisen in evolution because of manual dexterity, principally and it allows very precise uh, movement of the hands to play Beethoven or Schubert or whatever it might be. And that distinguishes human beings, you know, that dexterity. But that may come with a certain vulnerability. And it may be that this whole system is vulnerable because in, in recent evolution it's evolved rather rapidly and there's a sort of penalty to pay in a few cases as an inherent vulnerability. So motor neurons uh, have a specific set of cellular vulnerabilities. They have a complex architecture and, uh, you know, diseases arise, which are pure motor neuron diseases, so that tells you they're rather distinctive cells. For the future, what we really need to understand is, is really more about the subtypes of motor neurons. So we, we call the, you know, we look down the microscope at the spinal cord and we, we basically classify them on, the, on their size and their appearance, morphological criteria. And what we know now is that if you use uh, single cell transcriptomics, for example, you can pull out uh, many, many different types of neuron in any area of the brain. So, so the, the repertoire of neuronal um, function based on, um, on transcriptomic profiling will reveal whole new patterns of function and susceptibility to disease in the future, which will be very important in understanding the biology. Because in most of these disorders, there is a differential vulnerability. In spinal muscular atrophy, for example, it's the proximal muscles which are involved less than the distal muscles. So, that, so understanding the individual transcriptomics will ultimately allow us to understand more about how these cells function. So in fact, um, we don't really understand very well how cells are organized in a circuit in the spinal cord. So the motor output, which uh, determines the pattern of movement, um, is very complex. And there are automatic sorts of output, for example, for walking um, and, and, and posture. And then there are much more specific outputs which are under conscious control to a much greater degree, such as dexterity. So exactly what is the um, way in which these, these outputs are patterned in the spinal cord is not well understood. And actually that may be an important way in which they, they function and which they fail. The other thing that we'd really like to understand is actually what happens when a motor neuron innovates muscle in terms of its, its profile. So, we have, uh, along with other groups, developed uh, microfluidic chambers in the laboratory where we can grow motor neurons in one compartment. And then the, the axons grow through a track, they innovate muscle in another compartment. And actually the real question of interest would be what happens to the transcriptional profile of that motor neuron on innovation? Does it change its phenotype? And we know from development, for example, that there are approximately twice as many motor neurons at the beginning uh, as there are at the end. So, so cells will send out their axon, they will innovate muscle, and that will determine their fate through developmental programmed cell death. And if a muscle, uh, a motion neuron cannot find an appropriate architecture and innovation in the stable equilibrium, it will undergo programmed cell death. So that whole relationship between nerve and muscle is something we need to understand much more about. <laughs>